27, as we continue to explore the last sayings of Christ on the cross. But of course, before we do this, we really want everybody to feel at home. And we have some visitors here today from Michigan. And we're delighted that they're here. And just to make you feel good, we want you to know that today, this very day, the, the Studebaker company went bankrupt. <laughs> but not to worry, it got revived again, and then it didn't get bankrupt again until the 60s. But on the other hand, today is the day that Wells Fargo got started. So if you have your money with Wells Fargo, that's better than Studebaker. We want to welcome you and make you feel real at home today. Hope we've done that. Just did that research especially for you. All right, now then, let's take our Bibles and turn again, if we haven't done it already, to Matthew 27. Our verse will be uh, 46 that we look at, but let us start our reading at verse 38. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself if you are the son of God. Come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he delights in him, for he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We've used the word alienation because what we want to point out is that the nature and character of alienation, what really is it? We talk about people being alienated from their family, from their friends, being alienated by their boss at work, whatever. But which one of these words would best describe alienation in your estimation? Is it estrangement? Is it disaffection? Is it unfriendliness? Is it hostility, isolation, separation, distancing, division, dissension? But you know, regardless of the word or words that we select or how we arrange them, Alienation from God is spiritual death. And we, when we hear, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I would like to suggest to you that there is the moment of death. There is the moment of spiritual death. And alienation will always be with us. But we want to be sure that we are in the right side of alienation. For there is the alienation that's caused by unbelief and there is the alienation that comes around by way of redemption. And certainly families have been alienated over Christ. Certainly families have been united over Christ. Friendships have broken up. Friendships have been made. So the question is, what is the nature of our spiritual death and what does it accomplish? Notice that when we look at the alienation of unbelief, it begins with our attitude toward God. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, notice the description of alienation. hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, deeds that do not rise to the standards of God's law, 
deeds that do not rise to the standards of what it would mean to be a follower of Christ. They don't all have to be murder. They don't all have to be horrible. All they do is express the hostility toward God. And that is spiritual death. And notice God's response. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanderers and haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. I wonder if Paul left anything out. But notice that we, in our unbelief, in our alienation, as a company of people, we exchange the truth of God for a lie. And God gave us what we wanted. And we live with that which we have desired. And notice that alienation pretty well pictures the entire group of words. Greed. This will alienate us from people. Envy. Strife. Deceit. Malice. Notice that gossip is one of the characteristics. This is what we wanted in our free will. This is what we have wanted in our freedom of choice. Often is the time that we hear people talk about freedom of choice and we are free to do right or to do wrong. We need to make a distinction between being capable of doing right or wrong and being free. We are not free to murder. We are capable. We can do it with a gun. We can do it with a knife. We can do it with our hands. We can do it. But we are not free to do it. So at least for a company of believers, let's mark the distinction that freedom of choice is not true freedom when it does harm. We are capable of doing harm, but we do not have the freedom to do so. And notice the consequences. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. We were separated from Christ. The promises of blessing that God gave to the nations coming down through Abraham, being cared for by Israel, we in our unbelief, in our alienation, we were separated from Christ and we were excluded from the commonwealth. Strangers to the covenants of promise, hopeless and without God. This is spiritual deadness. And notice that we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which formerly you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. This is the alienation that there is between God and man. This is the kind of alienation that brought Christ to the cross. This is the kind of alienation that caused each person to walk by and to hurl their own insult. When we speak of alienation, we are speaking of spiritual deadness. And when Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? We need to understand that he is addressing this issue. And so we look then at the alienation of redemption 
And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Notice that he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. This was the purpose of Christ's coming. One of these days I'm going to get the congregation together right around Resurrection Sunday and we're going to sing all of the great Christmas hymns because that was when the gift was given. Now is the time when the gift is unwrapped and applied. And so we should sing some, some carol sometime on Resurrection Sunday. Being dead and alienated, when Christ was on the cross, he was addressing that alienation. He was the sacrifice for our sins that continues to create the gulf and the gap. And his sacrifice was to become the basis for a new life. Notice, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. It's through the work of Christ that we can die to sin and live to righteousness. This is the basic of what it means to be a believer. To know that we have died spiritually once and therefore we will not need to die a second time. And having been made alive in Christ, no one can take that life from us. And that sacrifice becomes the basis for the new relationship. Now all these things are from God. Now notice, who reconciled us to himself. He reconciled us through Christ. And look what he has done. I hope that we can really get a solid grasp on this because in my view, this is something that is being missed in the local lives of churches oftentimes. And that is when we have been reconciled to God through Christ, we have been given that same ministry of reconciliation. Sometimes, someplace we need to be confronting in love and in grace and in courtesy those who are alienated and spiritually dead. That ministry has been given to us. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. It is our duty it is our duty for Christ to people. When things get rough, often is the time that we hear people say, oh, if Jesus would come now. Good plan. But on the other hand, if heaven is really such a good place, why don't we get to go to it right away? You know why? Yes, you do. And that is that Jesus loves those who hate him. And we are to walk in his footsteps. And we are to speak of the love, the grace, the mercy, the promises, the hope. That's our ministry. And notice that there is indeed a price to pay. And Christ was the one who did that. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Look what he has done. He canceled out the certificate of debt there were decrees against us and those decrees were hostile to our well-being, to our spiritual goodness. And that certificate of death that was held against us was a certificate that we could never rid of ourselves. And so it was on the cross. 
And by God's grace, there is this one to pay the debt, but we do see him who is made a little lower, a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. How many times have we heard people say, you don't have the right to say anything to me because you don't know what I'm going through. Jesus does. He has tasted death for every man, every woman. That's what Jesus does for us. That's what he has done for us. We see him who at the beginning was God, was equal with the Father. Nothing came into existence except through him. And that one part of his creation, the one part of his creation that was created in his image, is the one who turned their backs on him. But he divested himself of his majesty, of his glory, was made a little lower than the angels. And because of the suffering of death, he was crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. When he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He went into a territory that you and I must go into, but he has been there and he is there to help. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cry of despair. How many people have been despairing in life sometime? Here is the one who in the 17th chapter of John prays to the Father on behalf of those who would follow him that they might see his glory and be with him. This is the desire of reconciliation. This is the desire to replace death with life. And he had to go through the alienation. He had to go through the separation between the father and the son. And the reason is that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Notice the double imputation. God took my sins and my unrighteousness and put it on his son. And he took the righteousness of his son and put it on me that I might be a part of the family of God now and forever. That I might be an heir, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And that's something that cannot be taken away from me. That's something that cannot be taken away from you if you have it. But notice that when we look at that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Notice in the 22nd Psalm, far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. And yet you are holy you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. The suggestion is, and I encourage you to read the 22nd chapter of the Psalms because some commentators say that practically every part of that is played out in the crucifixion scenario. A holy God cannot look on sin. He cannot fellowship with his son who has become sin for us. And that is the cry of despair. And he cannot fellowship with his son until the gracious act is complete. But we do see him who is made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus. And because of the suffering of death, he was crowned with glory. He may have been separated. He may have been alienated. But notice that gap was closed. That gulf was crossed. And it's for that reason that we do not have to face the emptiness of life. We do not have to face the question mark of the future. Because for us, 
The future determines the present. I know that Jesus Christ is my resurrected Lord, and I know that he reigns supreme, and I know that he will judge the living and the dead, and for this I know how to live. I know in part what my future should be and what I should be doing. And that leads us really to our challenge. And I'm interested in John 18, 4, because notice this. He's out in the garden praying. And Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? Jesus knew that he was about to face total death, separation of body from soul, alienated from his father. But here's the thing. He knew what was coming. He had already prayed, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And when they came for him, he knew why, and he was ready. And for you and me, who could care very little in some of our moments of unbelief, he did this for us. And he did this so that we might have life. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And this is the ministry that has been given to us. That we might share our life and share the reason for the goodness that we have in our lives and the things that cause us joy. And that is that Jesus Christ gives us life, everlasting and abundant. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I'm taken by that last part of the statement, that God were making an appeal through us. Let us keep in mind that when we speak the gospel, God is speaking through us. And if that is not an honor, if that is not a privilege, there is no such thing as an honor or a privilege in the Christian life. Because God has reconciled the world to himself. He stepped out of the hostility. He stepped out of the alienation. He put in place the ingredients for reconciliation and friendship. So we need to ask ourselves are we really reconciled to God or do we play church? And the answers involve matters of eternal life or death. And let's remember that we are ambassadors. And let's remember the importance of it. For Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. There will always be alienation until we enter into the eternal, the eternal state. And we are here, oftentimes, to meet those who would rather scatter than gather, to meet those who are opposed to, rather than in support of. Jesus did not promise that when we come to faith in Christ, that he would make our life easier. But he did promise to make our lives better. Better by what we are called to do, better by what we are called to be. And I love the activity of Christ on the cross. Remember when we looked at forgive them for they know not what they do? Remember the emphasis that was placed there? He was continuously saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And notice here, he cries out with a loud voice. In fact, it is not beyond the boundaries of interpretation to say he shrieked. 
these words, that they would know the separation that he now had, that you and I might be reconciled and be friends now and forever. Where are we when it comes to that gap? Let's be sure that we are on the right side and that we are trying to bring others over. This is what God wants from us. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer now, we thank you for the life that you have given to us in Christ and through Christ. We thank you that even though you gave to us what we wanted in our unbelief, you knew that what we wanted was not good and that you stepped out in and through the person of Christ that we might have life everlasting and life abundant. May we always be known to be with you and not against you. May we always be known as those who gather in the name of Christ. Thank you for all of the blessings that are ours and that will be ours. And it's in Christ's name that we thank you and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.